hello, everybody. Welcome to the Protect Knowledge series. We are recording this as we always do, just so you know. Um, and so welcome, we're excited to have you back. Hi, Dr. Bliss, how you doing? Hi, Fernando, how are you? Good yeah. to see you both again. Uh, so today's presentation is on early recognition of vestibular ocular impairments post-concussion leads to early treatment and earlier return to play. So this is an excellent presentation. We've been so excited to share it. Uh, Dr. Bliss is super accomplished and a very busy person. <laughs> She's at a conference as we speak. So we're excited to have her and we'll jump right in. Her presentation goes about 44 minutes. So it'll take up the majority of our time today. So just like we usually do when it runs a little longer, we try to encourage you to please enter all of your questions in the chat during the pre-recording as I play that, um, because Dr. Bliss is prepared to just answer them right in the chat function throughout. Um, and then if we have a little remaining time left over, we can do some live Q&A as well at the end. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and do some bios, and then we'll jump into the recording. So Dr. Bliss, PT, DPT, DHSC, is a clinical assistant teaching professor and the doctor of physical therapy program at the University of Missouri and is board certified in neurological physical therapy. She holds her, her certificate in vestibular rehab from the APTA, as well as an advanced vestibular certificate and is an impact trained physical therapist. Uh, Becky's been pr actively practicing in the field of physical therapy for 19 years with a specialization in concussion management since 2006. So her research uh, interests include dysfunction of the vestibular ocular reflex following mild traumatic brain injury, as well as early detection of impairments that lead to post-concussion syndrome. And currently she has several active studies specific to higher level motor control deficit identification in the sport athlete. Becky is active within the Academy of Neurological Physical Therapy and is currently involved in the Knowledge Translation Project related to evidence-based practice at MU Health. Um, so we're, we're super excited for her talk today. We've gotten a, a glimpse of it, Fernando and I, and we were super impressed. She's a real pro. And then, of course, Dr. Fernando Santos has his PhD in biomechanics and movement sciences and is an accomplished PT himself who worked with Paralympic athletes and people with balance impairments in his own clinic. He's also a senior applied biomechanist with Vertac, and he's my partner in creating this webinar series that brings you all here together. Um, so on that note, I am going to uh, share my screen and we'll all watch Becky's amazing presentation and we'll get back together at the end. But feel free to put your questions in the chat once again. Don't wait, the way you might not get your question answered. So here you go. Thanks so much for having me for this recorded webinar. Um, today's topic is going to be early recognition of vestibular ocular impairments post concussion leads to earlier treatment and earlier return to play. So our objectives for today, um, we're going to talk about just common vestibular ocular um, impairments after someone has suffered a concussion that can be recognized early to decrease the risk of protracted recovery. We're going to talk about comprehensive evaluation techniques to include utilization of the vestibular ocular motor screening tool for those non-vestibular specialized um, individuals out there that has gained some great traction based on its psychometrics for early identification. And then we're also gonna talk about some current evidence that supports vestibular ocular rehab um, to help decrease symptomology in our post-concussive athletes and lead to earlier return to play and or activity. And so let me get started by talking about where we've come and how far we've come. Um, for those of you who have been treating concussion as long as I have, you'll know that we kind of didn't have a framework. We didn't have any kind of um, clinical decision guides specifically on how to approach these patients. And I can remember back in early 2000s of, you know, thinking, well, maybe it's dizziness, maybe it's visual, maybe it's balance, maybe it's the neck, um, but not really having a framework. And now we have this conceptual framework um, that was put out by University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And we also have the APTA's concussion clinical practice guidelines that include a lot of these clinical trajectories. So as you can see, post-concussively, individuals can have deficits in any or all of these six clinical trajectories. And it's our job as the clinician to pick up what is the driving subtype? What is the driving impairment behind the person still having symptomologies? And then treat it appropriately. As you can see here, could be ocular, could be post-traumatic migraine, vestibular, could be cervical, 
anxiety mood or cognitive and fatigue. So today we're going to really focus on ocular and vestibular, but we'll talk about contributions, especially from the cervical spine as well, um, as that can also kind of mitigate and prolong recovery. So this is the clinical trajectory um, model over here on the left of all of, I'd like to say six bubbles, um, and then what your patient may or may not present with. And then you can see we've actually got objectively sound um, examination techniques in order to target those clinical trajectories. I will say as part of my comprehensive evaluation, I actually do most of these unless it's outside of my scope, like my cognitive and my neuropsychological testing, I give back to the neuropsychs and the speech therapist. But for most of this, I can do a brief screen to know when I need to refer out. But as you can see, it's a comprehensive evaluation. And so that's where a lot of the times these vestibular ocular deficits kind of linger or they're not picked up early enough um, in order to say, oh, this is the driving issue. And because their vision is straining, because every time they turn their head, they might get dizzy. We've got these underlying maladaptive patterns. You can imagine, you know, if you're straining in your vision, how you may kind of squint a little bit, kind of hunker down into that like upper cervical extension posture to try to clear your images. Or as well, if you're dizzy every time you turn your head, we may start doing kind of this on block movement. And so what was designed was the vestibular ocular motor screening tool that can help us early identify these deficits. In 2017, it was great. The National Athletic Training Association actually published this in their big magazine because the gaining traction on its sensitivity, specificity, um, very small false positive rate in helping with the diagnosis of concussion. And now we can see it's more widely spread. So let's talk about exactly what happens to the visual system after concussion. And then we'll talk about specifically how you can utilize the bombs. So yes, this is from military medicine in 2012, but this holds true in general patient population as well. So you can see for mild TBI versus control, um, a lot of the times they have convergence insufficiency. So that's the inability to see at near. So when we converge, our eyes come together and are holding our focus at near. That happens about 50% of patients post um, mild traumatic brain injury. Saccades are the ability to move our eyes from target to target. Um, and you can see that as well as about 30% of the time. Pursuits are the ability to follow a slowly moving target. So this would be at 20 to 30 degrees per second. So following a slowly moving target happens quite a bit, 60% in mild TBI. We can have ocular misalignments where our eyes aren't sitting directly in the orbit where they need to. Um, sometimes this is overt and you can see it like while well, you look at the patient. Other times you have to pull it out with specialized testing. And that would be your cover on cover, your alternate cover or your cross cover test. And you can see that that happens um, quite a bit of the time. The biggest one that I think affects our students um, people that return to work on computer screens, things like that, is this accommodative dysfunction. So that's the ability to go from near, far, back and forth, back and forth, and maintain crisp focus. And so you can imagine as a student learner, you know, you're writing notes, you're looking up, and then you're coming back down. That's that ability. And I'm going to demonstrate for you in a couple of slides what this actually um, feels like for your, your patient or your athlete. And so we have to think about how do, um, how does vision relate to other sensory motor systems? Because vision is the dominant sense, starts to develop around four months. We've got our vestibular um, system that starts at 48 days of gestation. And then we've got our cervical proprioceptors that is about three and a half months post-birth. And so if our eyes, our ears, and our neck aren't all saying the same thing, that's when we start to have symptomologies and maladaptive behaviors. So for example, if I were to turn my head to the right, my eyes said I just turned approximately 30 degrees in my environment. My vestibular system sensed that angular motion and told me I just turned about 30 degrees. And my upper cervical proprioceptors at C1, C2 cervical nerve um, rootlets also just told me that I moved about 30 degrees. So when one or all three of those are faulty, 
then we have symptomologies and then you can imagine kind of that maladaptive behavior, that overactivity, over recruitment that kind of causes that prolonged recovery if not picked up early on. And so some of, when we talk specifically of vision syndrome, signs of post-trauma vision syndrome could be an ocular alignment issue where one eye is maybe sitting out or up a little bit, having difficulty reading at the near. They feel like spatially disoriented where they just don't feel like they've got good balance because there's that lack of um, processing between the eyes and the balance system. You can have that near far focusing issue. We can have just psychotic eye functions, trying to read, not, remember, not remembering what we've read because our eyes are having to work 20 times harder um, to even coordinate, right? From line to line or word to word so that then it looks like a cognitive dysfunction. Um, we'll talk a little bit about ambient vision or unstable magnocellular vision. So there's two different visual systems, our parvocellular and our magnocellular. Um, parvo is right here what's happening. It's a little bit slower. Um, so if I was focusing in on the camera and something kind of moved out of my periphery, that would be magnocellular where I wouldn't have to look at it to see it move, but I would be proprioceptively aware. And this is kind of your fight or flight, right? You're looking across the street. Um, and you look one last time and maybe you see a car potentially come around the corner, you would stop and step back and not step out into oncoming traffic. And we'll talk about kind of that imbalance between those systems that happen post-concussively, as well as the low blink rate. So our patients often um, report to us that they have dry eyes. So let's talk about each one of these. So like I said, you can have this eye that sits out and or up a little bit. So this would be something called atropia because we could see it in room light, um, you know, just overtly looking at the eyes. A lot of the times this doesn't happen and we don't see it, but our patients are complaining of intermittent double vision, difficulty focusing, um, ocular strain or ocular headache. And so um, you can see from all of the malalignments, there's multiple here on the right. So you can have an, you know, normal is right here in the, at the top. You can have an eye that sits down, one that sits up, one that sits out, or one that sits in. Um, and so if it's very severe, you can see it kind of, you know, pre-injury, um, it wasn't there post-injury, now it's there. You may see that the eye is turning. You may see a compensatory head tilt or that person is reporting double vision. If it's subtle, we may not be able to see it when just looking at our patients. And we have to listen to subjective, but then also perform our objective evaluation. And that's kind of what I had talked about before. Another issue that happens is the inability to see at near. And so um, when we test this, we usually give them a target. I'm trying to see if I have a pencil. Um, you know, we give them a target. We have them come in close to their nose. It's part of the bombs testing. And they tell us whether or not the image ever doubles. If it doubles greater than six centimeters with corrective lenses on, then that would be seen as abnormal based on the VOMS threshold cutoffs. So you can see this cute little kid with no teeth. Lefty is the problem because it doesn't want to come all the way in. And then this, the blonde bubble girl, um, you can see it righty is the problem. It sits outward, but lefty is coming in. Um, we can also have a convergence excess, um, which is a spasm where somebody is converging and they can't release their eyes um, to then look in the distance. So if somebody were to have a vergence issue or a convergence problem, this is what it would be like for them to read. So you can imagine that as the words blur and kind of move on the page, those are some of the subjectives that we hear. But also you can imagine this might cause you to feel a little sick or nauseated. It may increase your headache. You may try to hunker down and stabilize um, to try to clear the images, or you might just say, forget it. I'm not going to read at all. So you know, pain while reading, frontal headaches, intermittent or constant double vision. They may squint or close one eye because that will get rid of the double vision, especially while they're reading. Um, and so this creates a huge issue when they return into their environment, especially if they are, you know, computer work, they write, um, student learning, those types of things. Um, so let me show you what this would look like in your examination technique. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this video. And what you're going to see is as she is pulling that in, 
So trying to read it near, lefty kicks out a little bit. Let's do it again so you can see that. And lefty would kick out. So this is actually part of the bombs. Um, this is near point of convergence testing. So what you would do is actually measure the distance from the nose to the tongue depressor of where the eye starts to kick out. And that would be her near point of convergence because she's not able to binocularly fuse or use both eyes together. Um, so if you're not actually watching, this patient would not actually tell you that they ever have double vision because one eye is saying, oh, I can't hold it. I'm kicking out to the side. This other example is of a softball player that I had. And remember, we talked about some compensatory strategies when there's ocular alignment issues. So you can see her head is already tilted because she's having that intermittent double vision. So in contrast, let's play her and you can see that she can hold it and then the eye shifts out. So she doesn't have the endurance. Let me play that one more time. So she comes, it goes in, 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 and then as she tries to hold it, the eye drifts out. So this would be another example of a convergence insufficiency. In contrast, you can have something called a convergence spasm. And so this is where we're asking the eyes to work. Let me go ahead and turn my volume off there. And so she's looking at the near, and this is when the eye doctor is actually gonna do the cover on cover test. And so asking one eye to work a little bit harder. And as she uncovers, the eyes start to spasm and they come into this convergence excess. Um, and this is not her trying to do this. This is her eye actually spasming, but she doesn't know how to make it release. And so sometimes if we can't get it just with normal therapy, they will actually Botox um, the muscles so that it can regain motor control. Difficult environments for people that have convergence issues would be anywhere that they have depth perception. So the grocery store, you know, schools in um, the hallways in school and or on the sidelines of games. Um, and in addition to that convergence issue, we can also have that accommodative dysfunction, right? Because if we go from near to far, near to far, and as we're coming in into the near, it's momentarily blurring. This is going to be an issue as well that computers, phones, and near work. So what would this look like? So you can imagine trying to go ahead and focus, like if I was looking near and then going far, one or the other direction, the things are going to kind of go in and out of focus and it's going to take a little bit longer. So you can also imagine that this might give you headaches, kind of feeling of ickiness or nausea because there's a visual neuroprocessing mismatch. The other ocular motor dysfunction that I spoke about would be psychotic impairments or ocular motor issues. So this would be somebody reading who have psychotic impairments or issues. And so you can see that they're not going from word to word to word to line to line to line. They're jumping all over the place. So these are individuals that really would report some mental dullness or that, you know, they may be reading, but they have to read it five or six times in order to remember because their eyes aren't working automatically as they normally do with saccades and reading. Um, other things like we talked about pursuits. Um, so trying to follow a moving target um, as well as saccades are responsible for that quick scan of, you know, facial recognition. So people will often say like right after injury, they, you know, met a lot of people, but then maybe not remember them when they see them again. And that could be because of the, the facial recognition part of it. Let me show you what abnormal smooth pursuits would look like. So these are inside VNG goggles. And so inside the goggles, they're following a moving laser light. And normally the eyes would be extremely smooth following that light. And here you can see they're actually kind of saying, I'm coming, I'm coming. And they're doing these things called psychotic intrusions. And it looks like the eye is actually jumping to try to keep up with the moving target. And that's exactly what it's doing. It can't use their smooth pursuit, so it's using saccades instead. The other thing I talked about as part of the post-traumatic vision syndrome is this unstable ambient vision. And so remember, we talked parvo is here, the what in front of you. Then you have this just natural awareness of, right, this what, you know, where, what's happening, those things in my environment. 
And so what happens is you can imagine with all those other ocular motor things is we begin to shut down and we don't feel good and we kind of just operate here. We don't do a lot of ocular mobility, especially if it's dysfunctional, we'll start to shut down this magnocellular. And that's really imperative, um, especially in return to you know, sport, return to play, return to fast paced environments, because they're going to be so focused in this tunnel right in front of them. They're not going to see things that happen on the side. Um, we don't have a great way to measure this clinically, although your neurooptometrists do. Um, so this would be a referral if you thought um, for them to have some of these issues. You can also, when we talk about rehab, you can actually upweight this system as well too. We can also have, so that would be the unstable ambient vision. This would be focal binding where basically the person only sees the trees and can't see the forest because their, their eyes are only directed to that central vision. Um, so they will start to have this like response of mass detail, right? So if I'm wearing this crazy busy shirt, they may not be able to just ignore it. They're gonna be over focal like binding and, and perseverating on maybe my detailed shirt or things like that. So that would be um, a subjective or just kind of like a observation that you're seeing with these patients. So you can imagine if those two things were not working, so that awareness of things happening in the periphery or over-focusing kind of, you know, that focal binding, trying to send somebody back to play would be detrimental if not checking for that. You need to have this balance. Um, so, you know, one, especially that magnocellular is going to affect your postural control. And so if you're overly focused on the parvo, anything moving in the periphery is actually going to kind of throw off your postural stability. Um, and in our lab here at Mizzou, we're actually looking at some of that in relation to, you know, throwing off and measuring on force plate data and tracking, which is really neat. And so, you know, when looking at the ocular system, we can't not talk about the vestibular system. So what happens exactly to our vestibular system? So this study is relatively recent that came out because what we thought was if somebody takes a blow to the head, it's probably going to take out the peripheral vestibular system. It would make sense. And you can also have a labyrinth concussion or an inner ear concussion. Um, you know, but then we also think about mild TBI or concussion being a brain injury. So then it would potentially be, you know, a brain issue. And so this study actually looked at preseason testing on the V hit, which is a um, objective measure of the peripheral vestibular system. So at baseline, going over a season of play, um, and then those who were concussed testing again to see was it the peripheral or was it central and what they actually found surprising was that it was a central vestibular issue, not so much a peripheral. Um, so when we're thinking about training, we've got to think about the order in which we train if there is a visual issue and a vestibular issue, which we'll talk about when we get to rehab. Just how important is the vestibular system? Well, it talks to every other system out there. So you can see it talks to our cerebellum and integrates within our visual system. Our three cranial nerves that are responsible for our VOR are three, four, and six. It gives us our you know, superficial sensation. It talks to our proprioceptors to know where we are in space. It tells us where we are specific to gravity and acceleration. Um, it, coordinates our ocular motor control, our posture, and then our skill movement as well too. So you can imagine with this skier, if his vestibular system was not functioning, he would not be able to maintain upright while going in acceleration and then in results to kind of those quick turns as well. So signs and symptoms of vestibular dysfunction, your um, individual may report dizziness, blurry vision. So it's our job to figure out is that blurry vision coming from ocular motor or is it coming from an oscillopsia or an unstable VOR? Is there nystagmus? Most of the time, the people that get to see nystagmus is our athletic trainers. Um, so by, by the time they get to us in the clinic, we don't often see it. They may have some associated ear ringing, maybe some true vertigo hearing loss, loss of balance, possible falls in a, like compensatory fashion. If they feel out unstable, they may go to a wide or a broad base. And then we also have the potential sweating, nausea, and vomiting um, associated with the dizziness because of that fight or flight response and its connection to the autonomic nervous system. 
So for those of you who don't know, um, our gaze stability system is part of our vestibular system. And so if you hold out your thumb in front of you and you turn your head side to side while looking at your thumb, your vestibular system will stabilize your gaze so that while you are moving either angularly, linearly, translationally, that VOR is stable and you remain crystal clear in your vision, but you also don't have the world start to move on you. And so for every degree of head turn to the right, our eyes stabilize that same degree to the left. And that can actually be measured in something called gain. And so, you know, things like that are gonna happen. They could have postural control awareness. They can have a VOR disruption. They can also have um, post-traumatic BPPV, which would be a whole nother discussion, um, kind of thinking about how much of the time somebody's crystals or rocks get knocked out after, you know, a significant enough of a head trauma. But how do we early identify these vestibular ocular dysfunctions in clinical practice. And that um, one tool that I have started using hot off the press in 2020 um, is something called the clinical concussion clinical profile screen tool. And so what I used to do is there's a tool for looking at convergence insufficiency that you screen your patients with. There's a dizziness handicap inventory. There's, you know, is it coming from the neck? I would give them a neck disability index. So there's all these plus the post concussive symptom scale, which talk about all of their symptoms, having them rate it, you know, on a scale of zero to six. This tool came out and shows really good concurrent validity with all of the ones I've already mentioned, but it is a one-stop shop and it also looks at function. And so what this does is based on your clinical trajectory model that I talked about earlier, this will, based on the patient's scores, put them into a clinical trajectory so you can see where their driving subtypes are. And I really like it because anxiety is on here, sleep's on here, cervical spine contributors. And so, you know, if somebody's really scoring high in anxiety, I know I'm gonna need to phone a friend in my neuropsychologist um, or psychologist to help me with that. And so some of the questions, as you can see, it scored none, mild, moderate, and severe. Um, but it, it trouble focusing your eyes while reading. It's very functional, dizziness when you move your head headache with sensitivity to lighter noise, feeling motion or car sick, sleeping less than usual, sleeping more than usual, difficulty staying asleep. And so there is some calculation based on the, the subcategories in your total score versus your raw score. So we've actually here at the University of Missouri created an Excel spreadsheet that we just import their scores and it automatically calculates for us. So if that's something you're interested in, feel free to contact me um, and we're happy to share. Um, in the fact that it would better serve your patients and then really pay attention to their driving subtype. So when somebody gives this, like our neuropsychologist gives this, potentially maybe they're the first point of contact and they see vestibular ocular really high, it's an automatic referral to a specialist and or like the cervical spine, or maybe it's a cognitive fatigue issue, then it's maybe speech. So you can see how this could be used to early refer for better multidisciplinary care. So that's what I would use for the patient's subjective screening tool. This would be my quick screening tool for the non-vestibular practitioner, which is your vestibular ocular motor screening tool. So I'm sure many of you have heard of this, especially if you've been um, anywhere near concussion in the last several years. But what this looks at is the um, individual's smooth pursuits, saccades, near point of convergence, their VOR, and their visual motion sensitivity. Um, and so what you do is you have your person right at their baseline, their symptoms from zero to 10 on dizziness, fogginess, headache, and nausea. And then after each of these clinical tests that are done very prescriptively in a very standardized manner, you're asking your individual to rate subjectively if it increases their symptomologies. What's really nice about this BOMS is that it shows a 2% false positive rate in even diagnosing acute concussions. So that was a recent study done by Wards et al. in 2018. And so if I was a betting woman, which sometimes I am, I would guess that maybe on our SCAT 6, there would be some components of the VOMS because of its really good psychometrics in order to even identify acute concussions on the sidelines. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. But 
This was designed for the non-vestibular practitioner to have a five minute brief screening tool in order to phone a friend or refer earlier to a vestibular ocular specialist in order to get these patients going um, and actually prevent maladaptive strategies or avoidant strategies because of their symptoms. There is one thing that I want to talk about, and this is mindful exertion and timing of the bombs. So if somebody has just done a ton of cardio and then you want to, as soon as they're done with that cardio or exertion, you want to test the bombs, it can give you a um, inflated score. So you would want them to rest about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, although there was just another recent publication that said when you actually have, you know, a VOMS done at rest, and then you actually do kind of some exertional training with your patients, it pulls out some of the underlying symptoms. So we've seen both ways, just when you are testing, know what you're testing and why you're wanting to test it. Um, what do we know about rehab? So those were the brief, what happens to the vestibular ocular system post concussive injury? How do we kind of screen for it the two different ways? And then what about rehab and what do we know about rehab? Well, there is significant evidence that a multimodal, multidisciplinary approach is key that includes potential if there is issues with psychological health cervical, vestibular, and then active exercise. And I think this is the biggest thing. There's multiple um, research articles being published specifically to better outcomes when these individuals have rest for 24 to 48 hours, and then they start their you know, monitored exertional program. Um, there is a great randomized control trial specific to cervical and or vestibular rehab when it's not done separately, but when it's combined together, you have superior outcomes. There's also some early PT feasibility studies that says even you know quick and early um, of referral will not give us any you know adverse reactions. So that was kind of the thought for a while. It was like, oh my gosh, if you send them too early, is it going to make them worse? No, it makes them better. Um, the earlier we can detect this, the earlier they start moving, the earlier their active rehab is, the better. Um, we do not, though, have any evidence on early, early intervention, although I think it's coming, um, especially in the active rehab side of things. So this is a great systematic review and meta-analysis that talks about active rehab and superior outcomes. Interesting enough, Letty et al. up at Buffalo, actually, um, we did a journal club a couple summers ago during COVID when everyone was stuck at home. And when they did earlier exposure to active um, therapy, right, after the 24 to 48 hours of rest, and they got people up and moving, those people had decreased incidence of reports of vestibular ocular deficits. And the natural process of just moving, looking, kind of moving and stimulating things makes sense because then you don't have decompensation. So interesting enough, even just by having them move early. We also know, here's a great um, systematic review and meta-analysis that says specialized rehab, targeted rehab for these clinical trajectories, whether it be a cervical issue, a vestibular ocular issue, an exertional autonomic nervous system issue, um, a psychological or mood anxiety. We need these specialized rehabs in order to target, instead of kind of, I think about the analogy of throwing spaghetti against a wall and hope that it sticks, when we do things that are targeted and we have a targeted approach to our examination and intervention, these patients do better. The big thing is when there is vestibular and ocular deficits, you have to train all the systems together. Um, I just talked about how the VOR, right, the ability to hold gaze while my head is moving, is underlyingly controlled by cranial nerves three, four, and six, which are part of our ocular motor system. So if you're not screening for ocular motor deficits in addition to vestibular and you're just jumping to vestibular, you're often missing the boat and you might be maladaptively training these individuals. And so, you know, why do we need this? Why is this important? Well, one, we know that subsequent lower extremity musculoskeletal injury risk is out there, secondary to higher level neuromotor control deficits. We haven't been able to pinpoint what those higher level neuromotor control deficits, although we're getting closer. We know, you know, some of it's that perception action um, theory where the individual is in the moment and they have to make a decision, right? Of like, do I go, no go? you know, kind of read what's going to happen on the field. 
We also know dual tasking is involved, but in all of that, we have vestibular ocular involvement, right? Along with our somatosensory proprioceptive system. And so if the patient has skewed or blurry vision while the body is you know, in motion, that's an issue. Do they have continued headaches that might be underlying from the visual or vestibular um, maladaptions? Do visual tasks increase their symptoms? We would not wanna put somebody back on the field where we knew that was happening. And this truly is that missing link, right? Of that full sensory integration of the eyes of the ears and the neck talking to each other. So I'm just gonna give you a little brief overview of some of the things that I do in clinical practice um, to make it as functional as possible and as real life simulated as possible to get them back quicker. So, you know, when we have a convergence issue, um, whoops, let me go back, let me hit play. There we go. This little handy dandy ball um, has letters and numbers on it. And then he is reading it as it comes closer. He's working on hand-eye coordination. He's working on gait stability, and he's also working on convergence. Um, it's not hard to guess that this individual was a baseball player. So as soon as possible, I put them back down into the position that they need to be able to work in when they return to play. Um, and so how does it look there? Can they still do it? What's their hand that their catching hand is? And I make it as functional, task specific, and as salient as possible to that individual. I may also work on, you know, reading it near while a moving object is coming, but then also you can imagine if somebody something's coming here and then they quickly have to look to see if somebody else is coming and get out of the way. We can simulate that in clinical practice by, you know, they're following a moving target and I quickly call out a letter behind and then they've got a laser lamp on top of their head that's cervical proprioceptive. So they know like, okay, is my head pointed exactly where I need it to be for my cervical proprioceptors? So working on ocular motor, smooth pursuits, and then reaction time. I also can work here on convergence and then quickly reacting in the periphery to something coming at them. Um, and this is something that would be extremely important to keep that magnocellular balance. What we aren't truly training Magno is because he's actually turning to look at the object that's coming at him. Um, so then we switch a little bit back to Parvo, but it gets that reaction time. It gets everything kind of moving. And I'll show you in a minute how we do all the Magno cellular. Accommodation training is near far charts. We do color numbers. We do all sorts of things of looking at near and far and then adding in kind of that like manual task as well, because we know when we can add in that proprioceptive feedback, it helps upweight the systems. Technology is out there. So in our clinics, um, you know, I do not have any vested interest in any technology out there. Um, but in our clinics, we, we have a couple of uses of technology that, you know, kind of look, you're, you're visually scanning, the object is moving, you're, then you're trying to sequence. So this would almost be like triple tasking. And if we had them stand on a balance pad, that would be quadruple tasking. Um, or we can also just have somebody work on reaction time um, as things appear, right? Is it bimanual? Is it unimanual um, as far as that goes? And it really, you could see it, it really scans the periphery as well to make sure that they're not losing anything within that focus that they may need to do as well. Um, other accommodative training. So this is an athlete I'm throwing back and forth and they're having to look to the left, read a color, catch an object, look to the right, read a number um, and switching tasks, switching between color and number are two different pathways in the brain. Sorry about that. Um, and so this is really difficult. And then they're also having to remember what line they were on and what order that they were on um, and going back and forth on my soccer ball is also letters and numbers. So they're having to read as it comes at them and then switch. And then I can be even harder where they have to reach outside of their base of support for that. I also may have them doing double, triple, quadruple tasking. So walking and tossing a ball, um, you know, reading and following that object while then looking out in the periphery and then looking for color number, color number, but that peripheral object is actually changing in location and something that's unanticipated. Um, so they would then have to quickly do the saccade scan to be able to find it. Other things out there, we've got ambient processing. So you can have, so some of the technology now has maybe doing multiplication or focus here while then being peripherally aware and hitting out little targets. 
Um, I often have patients look and they might be reading something um, that's up on the wall while juggling tennis balls. Um, and I don't want them to look at the balls as they're catching, just be peripherally aware. Um, I sometimes start with larger balls instead of tennis balls, just so it's a little bit easier. Um, there's also something called binasal occlusion where you can actually, if somebody is really, really focally binding, you can actually apply some opaque scotch tape to force them into that periphery and do therapy in that way, shape or form. Um, other things that I do, so this would be my ambient sport drills. So when they are ready and all the systems are working really well, I want them to upweight that magnocellular and that periphery. So you can see he's having to read as well, standing on a boost suit. So we're adding in postural control. He's reading the targets as it's coming at him on the ball, but then I'm throwing these little colored objects that he's got to, without looking, tell me the color as it goes by him. And then as he's able to actually add that proprioceptive feedback and hitting of the target. So never looking at it, but being peripherally aware enough. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm a huge Mahomes fan, um, you know, Kansas City Chiefs. And if you watch him on the field, he is literally doing this. As he's looking for his receiver downrange, he can kind of see what's coming in at him before it even happens and he's able to get out of the way. Um, so that would be an example of those ambient sport drills. Other things, so, you know, if there is an ocular motor system issue that you've identified in your exam, ocular motor comes first, you have to train all the systems. You can see how many things I had that person doing at once. Then once they're able to see clearly for near point of convergence, I start my VOR exercises in addition. So your VOR times one and two is just looking at a target, moving the head side to side. You can also move head and eyes opposite of each other. So you can imagine that that's definitely happening out on the field. Progression is you want to get them up into about two minutes of duration. You wanna work on speeds of what they have to be able to return to do. You add in cognitive challenges, pattern busy backgrounds, what position do they have to be to play? And then, you know, both training at near and at far because our gaze stability system works in all of those. This is just some great support of actually looking at dynamic visual acuity, um, which is a way that you can functionally measure the VOR, but you can see the controls in the light gray and then the patients in the dark gray at week one, we've got our mild TBIs. And by week four of training the vestibular system, they've now returned to match the controls of a normal functioning VOR system, which is really nice to see that yes, our rehab works. Um, you know, I may have them running. If they're having difficulty in the car, they might be bouncing and working on their linear or translational VOR. Um, different, you know, foot positions to challenge their vestibular spinal reflex or their postural control at the same time too. Other things that I do, you know, fast eye tra tracking, ocular motor exercises, saccades, hand-eye coordination, um, remembered targets of like looking and then turning their head and having to come back and hit the target. So, you know, if you have high technology, it's great. If you don't, this is your 50 cent version. Um, I like to stand behind my patients on a wall of letters and then hit right with my little laser um, target that I use for my cervical proprioception and then hit and then they have to actually respond. It's almost like playing, you know, with a laser and a cat, um, but it upweights those systems and you add in the proprioceptive piece. We've got other trainers out there as well. This is another um, exercise that I actually use with my patients. These are called four corner saccades, but I add in my cervical proprioception headlamp at the same time so that they can see where their head is in space while they're turning. Um, and so they have to remember what letter they were on, what line, and then go sequentially across. So for this one, they're going one, two, three, and four. Depending on what your athlete needs to be able to do, you can actually have them go in diagonal patterns or backwards patterns, or it's just the creativity of the therapist. Um, remember I talked about ocular motor and balance issues. And so this would be, just looking at smooth pursuits, standing on the rocker board, and you can see how much if somebody is overly visually reliant, that's going to throw off their postural control. So if they have to return to something where they're very unstable on their feet, um, depending on what they have to do while working their ocular motor system, you will want to upweight this system as well. Other examples, this is actually combining everything together. So she is scanning my little cheap, um, you know, letter number with cervical proprioceptors, and she's having to locate the next target 
in order back and forth and look at how accurate she is when she gets going while standing on a BOSU. She was a volleyball middle hitter. So she was constantly going back and forth. And so we were working specific um, exercises that were very appropriate for her to be able to shift and be kind of thrown off balance as she had to quickly change directions on the court. Um, there's lots of ideas. You just need to be creative. I won't play this just for a second, um, but this is called the cue ball um, hand-eye coordination. And it's a little ball that actually does not bounce where you think it would. Um, volume off. Um, but what it does is you can do all sorts. Remember I talked about those hand-eye coordinations and like juggling against the wall. Um, but you can also have them do some visual training as well of trying to read the different things. So you, you know, what does your athlete need to be able to do um, from that aspect? And you can be as creative and you can also send them home with this, which is great, right? What athlete does not want to have a ball in their hands to see that they can return to things. Other things I do, this is just, um, we were trying them out at home, but this is my son and this is impulse control. And so you can see that he can only hit the blue. And so patients post concussively visual reaction time, but then also that go no go pathway. So this is a great exercise for that. Um, I often send my individuals home as well with working on, you know, hand eye coordination, tossing balls. We were doing like a cute little family thing here, um, but they can practice all that at home. The other thing I want to throw out there is I am super lucky to actually have um, access to virtual reality. So this is the big Vertex CDP um, system. And so we will often have them kind of in these busy environments and stimulating, right? Like things that are moving and making sure their pastoral control is very safe and that they can ignore the unimportant visual information um, and still maintain that pastoral control because that's that balance between Parvo and Magna, right? When they get out. Um, and they go back. And so this is just another example of kind of going through the castle, postural control, moving, avoiding, hitting targets, those types of things. So then it can also be really fun. Um, and then you can also do some airplane flying um, in reaction to the way that you're swaying and moving. And so that's pretty neat as well. So that would be avoiding, right, the vestibular system um, so that they can ignore the unimportant visual information. So I know that was a lot, um, but I just wanted to give you an example of early recognition of that vestibular ocular deficit and then kind of some of the things that a vestibular ocular specialist would do in order to upweight those systems and make sure they were truly working where they needed to before um, they returned to either activity and or play. So um, I know in the live webinar, we will have questions at this point in time, and then here are my references. Hello, thank you so much, Dr. Bliss. That was fantastic. Uh, I, just to not waste any time, because we're gonna we're gonna get close to time here. But I wanted to ask you. We had some really great questions come into the chat. Is there anything, Dr. Bliss, that you would like to highlight or sort of summarize for the people that didn't see your answers in there? Um, no, I think one of the question was, and I think this is a really good one to bring focus on, is how often do you rescreen or re-give your subjective reports that are especially driven on, on the patient's um, symptomologies? And there's been some recent evidence out there that says, you know, every time they come in, you do not need to be saying, how bad is your dizziness today? You know, how bad is your headache? Like how, you know, instead um, they're recommending like minimum, maybe once a week. I actually push that out even more to every, you know, depending on how long I see them. I don't see my patients for typically more than four weeks, but I, I push it out there into that three and four week time frame because the more that they're focused on their symptoms not changing, the more that it kind of puts them on that hamster wheel cycle of maybe fear avoidance and thinking they're not gonna get better, those types of things. I also really change um, when they come into the clinic. I actually, my first question is, hey, tell me something that you can do now that you couldn't do since the last time you saw me, um, because it makes them automatically think about focusing of what they can do in that positive mindset. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, um, I've given a talk on fear avoidance behaviors post-concussively, um, and that's something that comes up all the time. And a lot of clinicians struggle with because we get the patients so late, they're already kind of in that fear avoidance behavior cycle. 
Mm -hmm. That's really important. Thanks for highlighting that one. Um, okay, so we have a few minutes left. Fernando, would you like to kick it off a short Q&A here live with some questions that we've gotten? Short? We have so many things to talk. Uh, <laughs> um, I do have a, a list, but I'll, I'll go fast and we'll go just uh, a few questions. First of all, thank you so much for your presentation. It was, uh, it was really nice. That's so much information. Uh, we will definitely talk about this questionnaire some another time uh, because I, uh, it's really interesting and I want to know a little bit more about it. Uh, but first of all, let's start with uh, what is a good uh, functional measurement for VOR? So in the clinic, there is the high expensive end um, measurement, and then there is the kind of low um, cost efficient one. So the measure that I use, I use both depending on which clinic I am. I'm in, um, so dynamic visual acuity test, the D DVAT is what they call it. You can use um, an eye chart and actually have the patient read just their static visual acuity while they are, um, you know, just head is still, and then you have them turn their head at two hertz or you turn it themselves or you turn it for them um, and then see how many line difference. There's also computerized versions of that. Um, so there's a BVA system I know, um, and a, you know, there's another um, one out there that you can actually then quantify. I really, um, I like the computerized version for myself because it also can quantify not only the VOR and it parses it out, is it a right VOR issue or a left VOR issue? And is that consistent with their subjective and especially with what they have to return to play at? I want to know, you know, exact, I'm a, I'm, an, I'm a measurement girl. I want objective data. Um, but the other thing that it does is quantifies gaze stability. How fast can that person turn their head and still see clearly? And so really looking at that in return to sport, are they ready or are we missing something? And are we putting them back on the field and putting them at risk of subsequent injury because we didn't look objectively at some of this data? Um, so that's what I use. If you wanna just measure um, you know, peripheral vestibular function, I mentioned it in the presentation, but that would be your V-hit um, as well. So there's, you know, there's multiple things or in the clinic, your head thrust test, um, which would be your non-technology. So there's multiple things out there. Um, like I said, I've been very blessed to be around technology, but then also really am a data girl. So I want objective measures before I make recommendations. Really good. Really good. And, uh, how I, I know you, uh, so, uh, let me it just go to Valerie question right now. Yeah, I saw that. Yes. Um, so it really, I don't, you know, it's typically sometimes if they're doing really, really well and they're coming back and they're compliant with their home program of their VOR exercises and we're doing a ton of functional things, looking at neuroplasticity, I may test them once a week, um, you know, and actually look to see, are they getting better? Are they moving in the right direction? Um, and those things. So I will often test them. My, the patients that I see um, are more athletic population here at the university. And so they are working with the strength and conditioning coach. They're doing everything they're supposed to on their own. So their response to therapy is pretty quick. If it's somebody obviously that did not like you moving their head and it made them kind of sick, I'm going to maybe not test them as frequently because I want to build up that therapeutic um, relationship. Or if they have a ton of comorbidities, they're geriatric. It's, you know, it's that lovely um, answer I like to give my students that they don't like, and that's, it depends. Um, so, but it, yeah, it really does just depend, but I usually once a week is when I'll, I'll revisit it, especially if I know they're being compliant and they're showing me really good progression in the clinic. Really nice. Just so, uh, I'll just read the question. So in case we put this video out there, it, uh, so, oh, everything is, I know coming. everything's coming now. I'm so trying to <laughs> the question was, how often do you recommend testing DFAT in GST? Uh, we have the next one there. Sorry, I'm going to the people that are asking there because uh, uh, I can ask some more questions later. So uh, I believe you mentioned uh, seeing patients for up to four weeks. How about the timeline of care for patients who have multiple comorbidities, including oh. the psychological, yeah. <laughs> as well those possible secondary gain factors, including BWC and litigious MVA. Yes, no, Karen, what a great question. Um, I think that those are number one, that 
it, it may be much longer than that. And, you know, they may have been in the cycle or in the healthcare system kind of getting punted around before we actually get a chance to see them. So those patients um, could take up to two to three months. And I think that's very, very good to, to pull up. Um, what I do when I am thinking about maybe the secondary gain or when there is legality involved, I almost often bring my neuropsychologist in for the validity testing, but then I also look at the aphysiological displays on the force plate tracing through my CDP system. So I've actually got the neurocom in one clinic and I've got the Vertec in the other clinic. So we actually will take a look at those in the aphysiological side of things and then maybe have conversations and really focus on um, you know, that positive mindset and getting them over. But I try to use all my data with that too. But I have seen patients, um, you know, I've been in practice for almost 20 years now and I've seen patients for that two to three um, month as well. So that's a great point. I'm super lucky with our knowledge translation project here at the zoo is we get early referral. So the type of um, how long it takes for them to get to CPT when they are recognized with this vestibular ocular is I can actually get my patients within seven to 10 days post injury, which is probably why my length of stay is so small. Um, because we've got them moving sooner, um, they're doing activities sooner, and so we see kind of that better results. And the literature supports that. Um, so we tried to really push that here for, our, you know, using evidence-based practice for translational science. Really good. So just to give a quick, uh, if I know that the next one can be like a really long uh, answer, but uh, how long uh, is utilized? Say that again, how the bombs is oh, bombs. yes. Yeah, so I actually, when they see me, I don't repeat the bombs. If somebody else has already screened them, my vestibular ocular exam is like, is the bombs on steroids, I'd like to say. Um, so I reserve that for my local athletic trainers or sports medicine physicians would go ahead and do the bombs and refer. Um, so it's, it's, you know, a five minute screening tool that should raise awareness if they are past the cutoff score of symptoms it should trigger an automatic referral to a specialist so that we can detect these early and get them going on rehab so that they don't end up with these maladaptive behaviors. So that's how we use the bombs here. Great, so next one, Valerie. Uh, <laughs> so what responses do you have experience with patients uh, who have experienced multiple concussions? Absolutely. This happens every day in clinical practice when I'm not teaching in the classroom. Um, so I ask a lot of questions. How did they recover from their previous concussion? Did it take a long time? Was it a short amount of time? How, how recent was it? How close in time frame? What have they been told? I want to know what has been told to them. Um, you know, who's involved in that return to play decision? Because, you know, there's no guidelines specifically. We don't have a CPG specific to this question, but, uh, you know, it kind of falls to everybody's decision to include the patient, the family, the sports medicine physician. You know, there might be others involved in that team. So I want to know a lot of information. Um, and so, it, you know, it's very variable. I have some people that have had multiple concussions, but they respond really quickly. And we, this is where I think we're lacking in objective data in, in clinical practice. So us that are out there seeing these patients to say truly has their higher level neuromotor control system really returned to where it needs to be, or be, you know, have they had a subsequent injury risk because we're, we're not testing at the highest potential of all of the systems working together. Um, and so that's where I think a gap right now that we need more dual tasking. We need more higher level neuromotor control, reaction time, postural control, and decision-making cognitive, right? At the same time, because look at what our athletes and look at even, you know, think about somebody who's in a factory working on the line who has to have this precise speed of reaction time to put what they need to right in the part. So I think, you know, that's kind of where we need to move in the future. And I know lots of great researchers out there, as well as those who are on this call are working at that. So that's exciting to see where we're going to be in the future. Yeah, I, I cannot say much, but I can say maybe we have something coming up in the future. But uh, I do like the idea of all the testings that uh, all the training that you're doing with the uh, dual task, triple task, and all the tasks in the world possible. Uh, do you can uh, do you quantify that? As I I know it's hard to quantify, right? But do you have a progression yeah. to them? Because I noticed that 
you have some uh, that you have to read something in a ball and then is your progression usually uh, putting more tests or increasing the velocity of uh, the way that words appear or something like right. that? Right. Um, I would say both. It depends, right, on the functional task specific training that that person needs to be able to do. So somebody who's not at a sport that requires that fast reaction velocity, then we may focus more on stability, right? And, and multiple things happening and ignoring crowds and loud noises and, you know, those types of things versus, you know, I kind of gave you guys the, um, the example of Patrick Mahomes, who is near and dear to my, you know, favorite um, football player, but think about everything they do at that moment. And so it depends. And that's where the principles of neuroplasticity really come into play and in how I design. Um, objectively, how do I track progress? Well, I actually look at compliance rates. Um, what's really nice with my high technology is that that's all automatically completed for me. So, um, you know, how many misses for visual reaction time or visual motor speed testing? Um, you know, how many times did they miss? Um, what was their reaction time? Or if they're in the CDP systems with virtual reality, if I have them actually doing something to hit targets, there's compliance rates. And that gives me objective data for insurance reimbursement and continuation of services. Um, I'll do often, like, how long did they tolerate before an increase in, you know, three to four levels of symptoms. So I actually like to push my patients into more of that two to three levels of symptomologies. I don't stop them the, the instant that they have symptoms um, because that over focuses on that fear avoidance. And so, you know, sometimes I'll do objective data that way or, you know, kind of um, look at the constructs of, okay, single task. Now we added a dual, now we added triple and this is what they're doing. That's, yeah, that's perfect. Uh, that's, that, yeah, that's why we, we try to always work on how can we do this? How can we make more objective metrics and how, how can you actually have those numbers there, right? To me, it was always important when in clinic, like how do I measure this progression? Mm -hmm. Some things I go like, oh, this day, someone did this much more and go on the paper, right? But it's so good to have a score or something like that. But there's a lot that we're still learning. It's hard to give a score, right? When you <laughs> do what is a good or bad. Uh, I just want to say uh, thank you, uh, Jackie. Just had to run, Jackie. I know, I saw. <laughs> from OSU, she, uh, she presented here in a webinar before too. So it's really nice to see people that presented, coming back, and so many researchers coming by. I know uh, Alyssa will, will, will say that too. I'm just going to steal her thunder here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this uh, our webinar is we're this is for uh, researchers, clinicians, and all of us to have a place where we can discuss and talk about. It. Although we talk about Vertac products sometimes, it's not a uh, to it's not an advertisement for our products, but it's a way for us to talk to everyone and see what is out there. How can we help each other, right? And that's what why I feel really happy and seeing really. Uh, good researchers and people here uh, listening and have you uh, speaking here today. So this was really nice. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much, Becky. Um, just to respect time, I know people have patients to run to and, and conferences to get back to and whatnot. Um, so it, we would love to have you back because there's so much that you could speak on. Um, we really appreciate your time today. I'm just gonna tell you all what's coming up because we have some really exciting presenters uh, coming up into the fall. Uh, so the next one is going to be on September 15th from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This talk is going to be on how force plates can be used to improve power athlete performance. Uh, so Cameron Hobson, who is a product engineer at Vertec and a former power athlete himself, as a matter of fact, um, he'll cover how the principles of physics can be used in conjunction with force plate data to improve the performance of power athletes in sport. And this is sort of like the baseline talk he'll give. It's more academically geared, um, sort of the science behind how force plates measure data. Um, it revolves around the concept of the force impulse, which measures the energy flow through the athlete during movement. Um, so you can learn how to use kinetic energy and gravity to produce a more efficient and powerful athlete. And he'll build on that topic in the future um, to be from a more clinical stance, but this kind of sets the groundwork for that. And then following that, on September 29th from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern time, we have Chris Ariano, PhD. He's an assistant professor in the University of Houston's Health and Human Performance Department. He'll talk about coupling the arms and legs during treadmill walking, cost benefits and trade-offs. Um, that's a really exciting one coming up. 
And then post that, we have a three-part series we're kicking off in mid-October with Dr. Joe Clark, who's a professor of neurology at the University of Cincinnati on concussion prevention, a subject which is near and dear to so much of our audience's heart. So um, tune in and you can go to burtac.com under the education tab to register or see what we have coming up. I need to update that. Um, so you'll see what's on the agenda. But in the meantime, if you have any questions, you can submit them to um, knowledge at vertech.com or any suggestions for future webinars. And I'll try to stay up to date on booking relevant people for you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Bliss. We really appreciate your well-prepared and thought out presentation and the audience had great questions. So it's obviously relevant to so many people. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Santos as well. And we'll see you all again next time.